hooked on a different kind of drug probably can tell you they use marijuana and alcohol before, right? There is a reality. I don't know that you're all going to agree with me or not, but I'm quite sure on the science research I've looked at, for some people, marijuana is addictive. Now, it doesn't mean that if they were addictive, they wouldn't have gone to heroin even if they never had access to marijuana. But for some people, marijuana is addictive. So can you give the examples? Well, Liz was getting high, and then suddenly she was using her mother's opioids, and those ran out, and then she was buying heroin. Of course you can find that story, the same way as you can find the story of Liz did too much marijuana in eighth and ninth grade, and then said, OK, I'm done. <laughs> Right? Um, so I don't know when you, when you want to take the steps further. And it does also tie into, as we're learning more and more about, the pharmaceutical industry went, set out to get us addicted to opioids. That's the first part. That's right? right yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's so the and that triggered heroin addiction. Do I think we should put anybody in jail for having an addiction? No. Right? I really don't. But do I think politically we're getting there overnight because we succeed in marijuana? No, I don't either. Um, just okay, a quick enough. answer. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. What are the roadblocks in Albany to the, the bill passing? I know the governor is probably not behind The it. governor is not a big fan. Has it ever gotten out of committee? Uh, <laughs> no, it has not gotten out of committee. So right now, it's the need to build up public opinion and support. And happily for me, as I watch public opinion polls here and in the, around the country, there is more and more support for decriminalizing tax and regulation of marijuana. As more and more states go down the road, more and more people go, oh, OK, you know, the world didn't end. Um, <laughs> So, so it's a movement. Now, it's really interesting to me when you look at what happens, has happened. The states that have referendum votes, they pass legalization. The states like ours that don't have INR, where you actually need a legislature to agree to pass it, aren't in a rush to do it. Why? Because politicians are mostly more risk averse than constituents. They're usually more conservative than their constituents. Now, there's also party issues. Ugh, why are the Republicans, even if they're numerically in the minority, still in control of the state Senate for the last 80 years? Perhaps changing this November 8th. We'll see. Yes. One of the reasons why is because of the conservative party, where the conservative party can get just enough votes to win or lose a Republican race. And the Conservative Party is extremely opposed to my bill. Now, personally, I think it might have to do with the fact that Michael Long, the head of the Conservative Party, is in the wholesale liquor business. Exactly. And he actually <laughs> thinks this is a direct threat to his business. But he would say, no, don't be ridiculous. That's not the case. Um, so, so interesting, like Michael Long and I, we actually agree completely on one issue, gambling. Uh. We're both opposed to gambling um, or opposed to government-sponsored gambling. So, but he really is opposed. And he has <coughs> told Republicans, you don't get my line if you come out in support of marijuana. So I have people who will tell me privately, oh yeah, they get lobbied for it. They don't really think it's that big a deal, but they can't do this. Now, the reason why they're so fearful of it, I'll give you this current life example. We passed in New York State a few years ago same-sex marriage. We did it with four Republican senators and all the Democratic senators, but one supporting. But we needed the Republicans, and we got four of them to come over and vote for it. The conservative party set out to get them out of office, got them all out of office. Every one of them lost the election afterwards. And the Conservative Party said, see, folks, you mess with us, we take you out. So as long as the Conservative Party is saying to the Republicans, see, <coughs> folks, you mess with us, we take you out, and there are not enough Democrats in the Senate, because frankly, the Conservative Party is never going to support us. Um, we have that 
<coughs> count the votes issue. So much easier to pass it through the Assembly um, than the Senate. And then you also have a decent number of people who say, well, I might be willing to go out on a limb for this if I actually thought the governor would sign it, but I'm not going out on a limb on something the governor's going to veto. So it's all an interrelationship. Wow. Yes. Um, so, oh, hi, I'm Rachel. Hi. Um, I work for an organization called Family Law and Cannabis Alliance, and what we do is we provide um, non-legal advice and advocacy to parents who are facing CPS actions for their marijuana use. And um, right now in California, it's a particularly a crisis where parents are getting their children taken away from them for legally using medical marijuana. Um, and so. One of the things we worked on with uh, the upcoming Massachusetts bill is getting parent protective language in the bill. Um, and it's right now, it's like the most adequate and it's coming up for a vote. Um, I'm wondering, is there anything like that that's in New York's like bill at all? Is like there any language that, because um, we have like um, specific language that we can provide for it that's like the strongest. So you're going to send me that language because I don't okay. think anyone go. has raised that to me okay. before. All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. I didn't bring 40 cards. Um, Liz at LizKruger.com. Okay. okay. Or just, I'm all over the internet. It's not hard to find me in the contact information. Yes, sir. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about the pharma um, industry and pharma lobby, uh, particularly. Um, so they, they seem to have uh, probably a negative effect in this whole conversation, yeah. I would imagine. But they also seem to have um, some opportunities. You know, you, you hear about some small pharmaceutical companies working with these, uh, uh, you know, materials and products and so forth, and maybe in other states, other countries, like you, like you mentioned. Um, what is it that we can do to advocate the right kind of positioning and angle so that we can kind of leverage their efforts? cynical side of me is as this becomes legal business, the pharmaceutical companies, the tobacco companies, and the alcohol companies will all rush in to become the majority businesses sure. in all cannabis businesses. So they might see it as, as Mike Long I think does, they see it as a threat to their immediate business model. And he doesn't manufacture alcohol, he's a wholesaler. Right. So. Even if he, I'll use him as an example, even if he is totally opposed, if it becomes legal, my guess is he'll wholesale cannabis products <laughs> the same way as he wholesales, right. wholesales alcohol right. products. If the tobacco companies go, damn, it's legal and it's sort of a similar product, we can do that, that they will. And of course the reality, and we've talked, I've talked a lot about this, of you know, not wanting necessarily to support or create giant sort of macro industries of cannabis. Uh, I know Ohio had a referendum a couple of years ago. Two years ago? One year ago? Last year. Last, Last year. year. And I looked at that and I said, far be it for me to tell people not to vote for something that actually could help legalize. But the way it was written, that only was it, five companies yeah. could ever be in was, the legal yeah. business. Yeah. And it was sort of like, oh, this is sort of a corporate written deal from behind the scenes right. and they sure. were paying for yeah. the whole thing. And I was like, yeah, I don't think that's really what I had in mind, but I'm not a state, Ohio state legislator. Um, so, you know, I do think the more and more real it becomes that this can be a legal product with all kinds of markets out there, recreational and medical, the more mainstream corporate America won't be opposed, they'll go, oh, I can take over that. Right. Now, that has its own negative impacts, right, right. Um, but that's my suspicion, that I haven't sat around worrying that they were the problem for taking the steps to decriminalize and regulate, that right. more they would be the problem if, you know, in some of the converse conversations about um, of justice issues with communities who have been most negatively impacted by the criminalization and not re lo not locking them out of opportunities when decriminalizing, <coughs> right? So I'm not sure that 
you know, the Philip Morris or the Marlboro of marijuana is likely going to be that great a community partner either. They haven't right. been, well, of course they're selling a product that kills you. Right. Um, <laughs> so I guess they're not a particularly good community partner. No. But you got my point. Right. Marlboro is actually coming out with... Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, they are? Yeah, they <laughs> are. Yeah. In California. We'll take a, just one more question if that's all right. Okay, you decide then since there's more than one hand. Would you like that? Hi, so it's, it seems like uh, cannabis is being categorized in three different buckets. Either medical, which is the pharmaceutical model, which is basically one bug, one pill. So if you've got halfway in the grave, you're allowed to use cannabis, where we know some states are very limited. What your bill is proposing, which is aligning cannabis more with alcohol and, and tobacco. But there's a third category, which really would be the one that I would love to see is looking at cannabis for what it really is, which is a plant yeah. and more of a nutraceutical. And I'm wondering, you know, you know, that's probably somewhat more complicated, but nobody is really recommending that in any states. And I'm, I suspect it's because it doesn't have the type of revenue to the state that, that your bill would bring, for instance. Well, I suppose it wouldn't, but... <coughs> I'm not even sure I love the nutraceutical model for other things. Yeah. All right. So one person says, it's not dangerous. <coughs> you can grow it. And then somebody else says, no, actually, it can kill you. Right? I mean, just like aspirin can kill you. Mm -hmm. Right? Doesn't mean we don't sell it over the counter, but we require instructions. You know, do not take if you're taking these things. Do not take if you have the following 22 diseases, right? Do not take blah, blah, blah. So again, I hear more about the concerns with people being able to package almost anything and call it, um, you know, not medicinal. And some of that stuff's actually pretty bad for you. Now, some of it's this weird hybrid. So, you know, right now, that's the other thing that's done real harm to the support for this, that the stuff they call synthetic marijuana? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why is it called synthetic marijuana? It has no cannabis in it. It's really dangerous. Yeah. Right? And they say, oh, it's just other stuff. Well, can it just be really bad other stuff for you without actually calling it marijuana? Correct. I'm really... So it was, I think, like intentional to make it tougher to go down the road of supporting legalized marijuana. But it makes me cringe yeah. that synthetic marijuana, you know, I think is clearly very dangerous. Yeah. And there are people who would argue, well, it's not illegal, um, but it's doing real harm, and it's doing real harm to this movement because <coughs> they call it synthetic marijuana. So maybe you're not seeing this proposal in any other state because lots of people share my view. But I, I just don't know. I don't think I've ever had that conversation with someone. How can we help you? Oh, thank you. No, that's a good question. That is a good question. question. So whoever your legislators are, you can go around and talk to them about why you hope they'll support or why you'd like to know why they can't support it. Right? There are legislators who tell me, if it comes to the floor, I bet I'll vote for it. But don't ask me to put my name on the bill in advance. And that happens all the time. We all pick our fights, right? So, but I do think we need more legislators um, to come out and support the bill. We need legislators outside New York City to come out and support the bill. I'm delighted that my lead co-sponsor in the assembly is an assembly woman from Buffalo, Crystal People spoke, Stokes. Crystal People hyphen Stokes. She's an African-American legislator from Buffalo. I reached out to her early on, because we were friends, and I said, this is a huge issue in Buffalo. I look at the stats, and what do you think? And she immediately said, absolutely. And then it was sort of funny, because we were both <coughs> joking about, like, oh, we're sort of, we're the odd couple to actually do these bills, because we're both sort of grandmother age. <laughs> I know psychologically I have to deal with that, but I can't. So we're both sort of grandmother age. We don't use the product ourselves and are comfortable saying we wouldn't if it was legal. Um, we can, we're, we're women and can talk about it the way I've heard lots of folks talk about 
being panicked as moms that their kids are going to end up in the criminal justice system just because they go off and do something that they did when they were teenagers themselves. Um, so there's something about women, interestingly, that you can actually get more <coughs> discussion going quickly. Um, but it really is important that outside the city of New York, you've got legislators who are prepared to support this. Interestingly, when I go upstate and talk about this, I talk about farmers being yeah. able to yeah. increase the number of crops so, that they can sell and create business opportunities <coughs> for themselves. When I introduced my legalized marijuana bill, I also introduced at the same time, but yeah. kept the bill separate, <coughs> a legalized hemp yes. bill. Yeah. Right. So I was like, okay, let's get the farmers to understand. Well, a Republican senator very quickly came to me and said, I want to support that bill, but I can't support you. Can I just have the bill? <laughs> I said, yes, go get that bill passed. Yeah. Right? It wasn't about me. It was about getting the, the bill passed. So I was like, excellent. And when you get that done, come back and we'll talk about legalized marijuana. Yeah. So we talk about things right. in different ways with different people. Amen. Are religious institutions a problem for you? I, I don't know if there's a universal position of, of the religious institutions. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm not sure that I have asked any specific religious organization to join me in this effort. So, you know, clergy for legalized marijuana, that could be a very effective message. Anybody a clergy? Yeah. Um, okay, there you go. And actually, no, I'm serious. Clergy get taken very seriously mm -hmm. by elected officials. Rabbi so Steve. something that I spent a lot of my life on is reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. And I started the Pro-Choice Bipartisan Legislative Caucus. And there's a group called Clergy for Choice. And they're my favorite group because when you get ministers, rabbis, and not actually priests, but there's a Catholics for Choice group to come together and ask for appointments with anti-choice Republican legislators, <laughs> they take the meeting. Yeah. They, you may not change their mind, but they're like, there's a priest outside, or an almost <coughs> priest, a rabbi and a minister. It's a bad bar joke, but it's also, <laughs> they showed up in your office, you're taking the meeting. What are the possibilities for an issue in New York State? So Sorry, so we have uh, we to stop yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, we require our changing our constitution yeah. to be an I in our okay. state. Yes. 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 Thank you so much. Nelson. Jen, thank you so much, Senator, for coming and speaking for us today. Uh, the next portion of our event is going to feature the Students for Sensible Drug Policy panel. But before that, we're going to do our traditional giveaway. Uh, we have a raffle. Everyone got a raffle ticket, I hope. So, first off, I'd like to give a shout out to the Cannabis Hemp Association. They hooked us up with these lovely uh, food and bev today, so give them a shout out. Fortunately, they couldn't come, but they did help us out with uh, helping us with some nice cultural local food here. And I'd like to introduce Mike Z, yeah, uh, the yeah. founder of High and Wine. Yeah. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Hey, Mike. Um, <laughs> what a great job by Senator Kruger. Yes. Tough yeah. act to follow <laughs> over there. It brings me a lot of joy to hear an elected official speak so intelligently <laughs> about cannabis and so sensibly about cannabis policy. But anyway, thanks for having me. We're going to be raffling off. Uh, my book, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Cannabis, basically as I've organized dozens of cannabis education events here in New York, <coughs> I got to meet a lot of industry leaders and ask them for their advice for entrepreneurs. Um, and then I put it together in this book, and the book's available on Amazon for 420, the ebook. Uh, I didn't bring a bunch of physical ones, but I'll be happy to sign this for whoever uh, When's the raffle? And thank you guys. I think this organization is doing great work. So thanks for including me. 
I appreciate it. Will you do the honors? Ooh. I'll pick the number, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Oh, two. Four, two, zero. Three, seven. You guys are looking? Three, seven, eight, four. Yes.